and the conference, and Superintendent uh, Jeffrey asked me to come over here and then install your pastor. And so we have come over, spent a beautiful weekend with uh, some of your leaders. And so we're going to start this morning, and um, uh, I, I've got a little uh, service here that's uh, to honor and to recognize uh, Alan as your pastor. It says, we are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the head of the church, to install Alan into the ministry of this church and congregation. And Alan, I would like to have you stand right here and Sherry along with him because it's, it's a cooperative. It's, you're standing next to him. Alan, it is our belief that the calling into the Christian ministry and to particular service within it, is both of God and the church. It is inward constraint and outward calling, answering to each other. Are you persuaded that you are truly called to this particular ministry to seek to fulfill the purposes of God among the people of the springs of living water Free Methodist Church? Members of Springs, I called you Springs. Is that okay? Springs. Because it seems a little long. Springs. Members of Springs, are you persuaded that Alan is the person whom God has brought into this time and place to be your pastor? A leader for you and this ministry. Will you please indicate your positive reply by standing to your feet? Because you, Alan, and you, the people of this church, are the ones who are giving yourselves to share share this ministry in this place and this community. We invite you to each uh, respond to each other in our hearing. Uh, Debbie, uh, where are you? Right here. Do you want to come and lead this part? The congregation, let's read together. This is a commitment that you're making to... Pastor Allen. We believe that you, Pastor Allen, and the person intended by God to be pastor and leader of our ministry, it is in this belief that we now celebrate your appointment as our pastor. I believe that you, the congregation of Springs of Living Water Free Methodist Church, are the people among who I am, I am intended by God to serve as pastor and to lead into ministry. It is this belief that I have accepted the appointment to your fellowship. Would you read together with me this? We ask you, Pastor Allen, to give us some assurance as you become our pastor. Will you give yourself, by the strength and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, to be sensitive to the needs and possibilities of all of our people, singly, in families, and as a congregation? Will you help us to grow towards Christian maturity through your preaching and teaching, your example and counsel? Will you stimulate us to love one another and to serve one another? Will you help us to communicate the good news of God in Jesus Christ to the people of our community and world? Will you seek to enable us to be an effective part of the River Conference and the Free Methodist Church around the world? God being my helper, I will endeavor to do all these things. Now I ask of you some assurances. Do you understand yourselves to be sharing Christ's ministry with me in the fellowship of this church? Will you be sensitive to my needs and possibilities as a fellow member of the Church of Christ, and seek to minister to me and my family as well as with me. Will you assure me of your confidence, your encouragement, your patience, your prayers? And finally, will you commit yourselves willingly to the task which will give shape and energy to our ministry together? To all these questions we affirm, The Lord being our helper, we will endeavor to do all of these things. We accept you, Pastor Allen, as a person of Christian commitments 
and God-given gifts, we accept you as our pastor and leader of our ministry. I accept you, the people of this church, as person, persons of Christian commitment and God-given gifts. I accept you as the people from, from people whom God has given me to pastor. Alan and Sherry, would you come and kneel at the altar? Uh, those who would like to come, Pastor Lowell, would you please come forward? And some of the board members, if you'd like to come forward. And let's just lay hands on him. Lay hands on him and pray. May the Lord be upon you and the Holy Spirit for the work of pastor here at Springs of Living Water. Father, we ask that you would guide our brother, that you would strengthen him, that you would lift him up, that you would give him wisdom beyond his years. Father, that you would inspire him and that, Lord, together, with these people, many would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That Lord, there would be, we'd make it very difficult for people to go to hell in this, in this valley. Father, anoint Him and the people for Your work. Make them adequate, Father. That they may see Your kingdom come and Your will be done for those who are lonely, brought into fellowship, those who are lost, found, those who are broken, healed, those, Father, are confused, find the truth. Father, just bless Alan. Bless Sherry. Bless their family. Bless the springs of living water, Free Methodist Church. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Let me take, stay up here. Take this, this Bible. Just hold it. Put your hands upon it. Alan, take authority to minister the word of God. Faithfully proclaiming the word, declare his forgiveness, celebrate the sacraments, and the shepherd his people. May the Lord bless you, my brother. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Jacob, you want to close this, this part with prayer. Well, I want to be like the first one to congratulate you. So, congratulations, Ed. You're the reason why I'm inspired to go to Moody now. And I'm so proud of you. I love you, Dad. God, thank you for blessing me as such an awesome father and role model and best friend and awesome pastor and help him to lead this church with your will and just bless him and bless the church. And In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. If you'll take out your Bibles, we'll have Scripture reading. First verse is Ephesians 3, 7 through 21. I became a servant of this gospel by the gifts of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because, my, because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of this glorious, out of his glorious riches, 
he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be fulfilled or that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our second verse is Second Corinthians six, one through six. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance and troubles, hardships and distress, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. And that's our scripture reading for this morning. Oh, and young children may be, may be dismissed for Children's Church. And now, Pastor Allen has a sermon. Hear me now? Yeah. Uh, so, when I was sitting down there, everybody's praying all over me. I'm like, I thought I'd got over these nerves, <laughs> but I haven't. So then it reminded me, well, instead of maybe this sermon, maybe I ought to just look at um, Jonah and preach, repent. You know, that's basically it, and see if that helps. But I'll give you, I'll try to give you the sermon that God laid upon my heart, and we'll see how it goes. Today's sermon is titled, But How Can I Take the Eye Out of It? Uh, Let's start with prayer. Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Father, that you just continue to pour out your love. It's overwhelming. Father, that you would choose somebody like me. That you would desire to have a relationship with me and everyone else that's in here. We didn't do anything and you did everything over and over again. And we just thank you for that, Father. May we give our lives back to you. May we bring glory and honor to you as we were created to do. Bless your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, if you were here, we talked about taking the eye out of it. That means that we take the eye out of the situation, that it's not about us. And we looked at Matthew 18, and we looked at the whole chapter so that we could get a glimpse of what is, what's going on there. We looked the week previously and we saw that in Matthew 16, Jesus introduced the term church for the first time in scriptures. And church is a Greek word from ecclesia, which means it's two words combined together, which means an assembly and called out. So as a church, we are an assembly called out of the world to be the light to the world. We have a purpose. We're not just here to congregate for our own needs or what church brings us. And so many times we get misfocused on that because that's what the American dream is all about. It's what I'm going to get out of it. So we even approach church with the same type of attitude. We approach church with, what am I going to get out of this? Am I getting fed? Do I like the pastor? Do I like the music? So we need to take the I out of that situation. We need to serve as Christ served. We need to serve with His heart rather than our heart. So we looked at Matthew 18. And I challenge you to go back and look at that and study it. Because it's a very critical and important chapter on Christian ethics and living. It gives several qualities. And if you don't look at it as a whole, you tend to misconstrue some things. Especially the scripture that talks about where if your brother sins against you, 
We take that and we say, here's a passage now that I can use to say that Joe over there offended me. So now I've got the Bible to show me how I have a right to go say something to him. That's not what it's about at all. It's about humbling yourselves and living a life that brings glory and honor to Christ. Remember, this is only the second time in this passage that the word church is mentioned. So the first time was when Peter had his aha moment in um, Matthew 16. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are Christ. You are God. You are the Messiah that was promised to us. He had that moment where he realized, because God revealed it to him, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. <clears throat> that He came to save us from our sins. And that's so awesome because there's nothing that we can do. God loved us so much that He stretched out to us. He reached out to us and saved us. Something that we could never do on our own. And Peter realized this. And Jesus said, Upon your profession of faith, Peter, your belief, this is what I'm going to build my church on. So we as a church belong to Jesus. We are His church, called out for a purpose, to bring the gospel message to others. And we have to do that in the acts of unity and love, not just as individuals, but as a body. So this is the second time in Matthew 18 when Jesus mentions church. And guess what? It's already in the context of there's a problem, because that's what we are. We're sinners saved by grace, right? Not by our works, but by God's grace. So the church is mentioned, and it's mentioned when your brother sins against you, that you go to, the ch- you go to him first, and you- it's using Old Testament principles. And then if he doesn't understand or-, or turn from his sins, you take it to the a witness first, and then on to the church. So the second time we see church is by Jesus again, and we see that now there's a problem. Well, we can't have problems in our church, because we have to have unity. Not We won't have problems, but we need to figure out how to handle those problems. And the best way to handle those problems is to love them like Jesus, right? Love covers a multitude of sins. So I just want to review a little bit about Matthew 18. If you look at it, some of the uh, headers that man has put in, in the first of Matthew 18, it talks about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And if you've got a pen, write these down. They're worth remembering. This is what Matthew 18 says about Christian living. The first concept is humility. Because the disciples were arguing, saying, who's going to be the greatest? When yet you need to humble yourselves. So if you want to take the I out of it, you've got to first humble yourself. Then we read on a little further, and you see the section entitled, Causing to Stumble. If anyone stumbles, we have to have responsibility. So the second thing is responsibility. First step is humility. Second step is responsibility. If we cause them to stumble, then we have to be accountable. We have to be responsible for it. The next principle is denying self, to be Christ-like, to be Christ-centered. It goes on to say that if one sheep wanders away, would the shepherd not go and leave the rest of the 99 to find that one sheep? And it says that if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, whatever reason causes you to stumble it would be better for you to cut your hand or foot off or to gouge your eye out. It's not saying that you should mutilate yourself or anything else. It's saying that it is more important for you to deny yourself to serve others. It's not about you. Then we go on a little further and we read the parable about the wandering sheep and we see that there is care for individuals. So once we deny ourselves, we have to care for other individuals. Just as Jesus Christ died for all and cared for all. He had the power to call a legion of angels and stop the persecution that he was going under. But he didn't because he knew God's plans. He loved you and I unconditionally. So we've got to have humility, responsibility. We've got to deny ourselves. We've got to have care for individuals. And then what if we have problems? Sin does come along, doesn't it? Because we're imperfect individuals. And we studied here, if you haven't paid a lot of attention to it, some of your Bibles will say if your brother sins. Some of your Bibles will say if your brother sins against you. Two words are missing in some um, versions of the text. Why is that? Well, it's called a deviant in Scripture. But what it means when there's a deviant is like Jesus Christ went and performed 
miracle, we, one translation would say. Another translation would say Jesus went and performed a miracle. If that word is not in the text, it's not significant to the text. The text doesn't change meaning if that's not there because there are some discrepancies in some of the texts that we found. But against you is a big two words, isn't it? Because that means a difference in whether my brother just sinned or whether it was personal, right? But if we take against you out, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter if it's personal. And we've got to understand that. Then when we take the I out, we don't have those issues anymore. Who cares if my brother sinned against me? What matters is my brother sinned. And I need to go after that wandering sheep. And I need to deny myself, not be offended because it was something against me. And go out and do my best to find that sheep and bring him back to the fold. So it doesn't matter if you read against you in there or not. Because it's not about you. It's about God rather than you. So we have discipline as the next characteristic. Then if you read on, we have brotherly love and fellowship. Why do we need that? So that we can grow as a body of Christ. So that we can be healthy rather than infectious in our body. So that we can reach others rather than be a stumbling block and causing them to to go away from God. Then we read the section about the unmerciful servant. We've already got our examples, but here's a guy that doesn't get it. He doesn't get the I factor. You've got to learn to forgive and give mercy and grace, just as Jesus Christ did, so that we can bring unity to the body. And then the last verse closes with, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So this passage closes out with that. God is the one who's in control. He's the one that created you. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And Jesus loved his brother and sister. He loved them enough to give their life for them. So how could you read that passage and let it be about you? The things that you need to get, again, are humility, responsibility, denying yourself, caring for individuals, discipline, brotherly love and fellowship, forgiveness, mercy, and grace, and wisdom. That's the things that we should have got out of that text last week. But sometimes we still get focused on ourselves. So I thought we would follow up with, but how can I take it out? We know we're supposed to, but how do we do this? Why do I stumble and fall so many times when I want to do good? Because I'm sinful. I will stumble and fall. And that's why I do need you as brothers and sisters to uphold me, especially in your prayers. To be there for me, not against me. And to realize that I make mistakes just like every one of you makes mistakes. But when that happens, we need to seek after that lost sheep. We need to go after them because we love them and we love them more than we love ourselves. If it takes a little bit of effort, so what? That's what it takes. We watched the movie um, Friday and the guy compared church to the locker room. Because this is where we're at getting our instructions and everything. So that through the rest of the week we can go out and play the game. That's where the action happens. That's where we're called to live out our Christian lives so that we can be examples to others. And if we can't do it here, how are we ever going to do it out there? 1 Peter 5, 6 and 9 says this. And it starts out basically like Matthew 18. It says, humble yourselves. There's a the key to the start. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. He will lift you up. Not you. Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist Him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Humble yourselves is how it begins. You have to take that eye out. Cast all of your cares upon Him. His shoulders are big enough. Yours aren't. And when you learn that, it's just such a release. Because God takes care of it. You don't have to anymore. And I know that we try to do that. We try it in every aspect that we do in life. Because we think we've got to provide. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Well, when you have that mentality, then you start putting yourself first. 
You put I first instead of God first. Then when God calls you and says, do this, you say, I will when I get this done, Lord. So who are you putting first? God or yourself? The I has to go. I'm going to read to you next Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. And this is from the message. And when I read from the message, it's because I liked what the message said. It sounded cool. (laughs) I got something different out of it, a different angle. And this section is called, Torn Between One Way and Another. Starting in verse 1. You shouldn't have any trouble understanding this, friends, which means fellow believers. So we shouldn't have any trouble. It's right there in black and white in His Word. You can't pick or choose. You have to follow it as a whole. For you know all the ins and the outs of the law, how it works and how its power touches only the living. For instance, a wife is legally tied to her husband while he lives. But if he dies, she's free. If he lives with another man while her husband is living, she obviously is an adulteress. But if he dies, she is quite free to marry another man in good conscience with no one's disapproval. So, therefore, here's the rest of the story. My friends, my fellow believers, this is something like what has taken place with you. When Christ died, he took that entire rule-dominated way of life down with him, and he left it in the tomb, leaving you free to marry a resurrection life and bearing offspring of faith for God. For as long as we lived that old way, doing whatever we felt we could get away with, sin was calling most of the shots as the old law, as the old law code hemmed us in. And this made us all the more rebellious. In the end, all we had to show for it was miscarriages and stillbirths. But now that we are no longer shackled to that domineering maid of sin, and out from under all those oppressive regulations and fine point, we are free to live a new life in the freedom of God. When Jesus died, He took your sins away once and for all. If you accept Him, you are a new creation. You have a new life. Sin no longer dominates you. But you've got to let God empower you and lead you through His Spirit. You've got to give the eye out of the factor. Reading on in verses 14 through 25, it says this, And I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I am full of myself. Let's say that together. Yes, I am full of myself. At least we finally admitted it, right? (laughs) After all, I spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then act another. Doing this, I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For I know the law, but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't, rely, I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good... Sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything. I have tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Here's the answer. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Isn't that awesome? He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions, where I want to serve God with all of my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Paul is saying these words. Probably the greatest apostle that ever lived. He, not single-handedly, but close to it, spread the gospel message to the known world. He spent his life in obedience to following Christ once he was converted. 
And he didn't even marry because he didn't want the hindrance. Even though marriage is a great thing that God designed, he wanted to be totally focused on serving God. But he still struggled. He realized that if he had the eye in the situation, he was going to fail. He had to be transparent. He had to be an empty vessel so that God's Spirit could fill him and use him so that he could bring glory and honor to God, which he was created to do. I'm going to read Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 12 from the message also. And this one's entitled, Don't Assume You Know It All. Good friends, don't forget all I have taught you. Take heart to my commands. They'll help you live a long, long time. A long life lived full and well. Don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and the eyes of the people. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. There's that I again. Listen instead for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He is the one that will keep you on track. You can't, but He can, and He does. Don't assume that you know it all. Wow. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give Him the first and the best. That's what we do when we lay our gifts at the altar. We give Him the best that we have. Jesus Christ sacrificed His life for us and calls for sacrificial love from us in return. The best that we have for our friends, our neighbors, so that we can bring glory and honor to Him. Revelations 4.11 says why we were created. It says, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. We didn't. God did. And by your will they were created and have their being. God reached out to you because you couldn't do it on your own. He reached out and invited you to accept Jesus Christ as His Savior. But there's a big difference between just accepting and following. If you're going to follow Him, you have to take the eye out of the situation. God has called you out as a people as a church, to serve Him with all of your heart, to be a holy nation, to be the salt of the earth. What good is the salt if it loses its flavor? It's good for nothing. It doesn't season anymore. It's worthless. It's to be tossed out. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a life that's worthless. And I don't want you with me either because I love each and every one of you as a brother and sister in Christ. I want us to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. We are called out of this world by God to be His holy people. And the definition, the defining characteristic of this new church is what? That we will know each other by our love. But yet if you go out on the street and ask many people, especially the ones that aren't coming to church, what do you know people buy in the church? Hypocrites, lack of love, two-faced. Why is that? It's got to be because something that they've seen. And I'm not condemning... I'm just stating what you'll find when you go out there. So that means that we need to rely on Christ a lot more than we need to rely on I. The Scriptures are clear. You can't do it on your own. God has called you to a life holy and worthy. And you can only do that by taking the I out of it. John 14, excuse me, John 13, 34 and 35 says this, A new command I give you, love one another. Not just love one another, but love as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, here we go. Like we just said, what the world will see is that by this, by either your love or your lack of love, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Scriptures are clear. Jesus commands it. You have freedom of choice. You can decide what you want to do. But Jesus calls you once you have been saved to live a life worthy of that calling. John 14, 15 through 17 says this. And that section is entitled, Jesus Promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. 
The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. When Jesus left, He knew you couldn't do it on your own. It was part of God's master plan. So He empowered each and every one of us with the Holy Spirit. God lives inside of us. If we live a life that brings honor to Him, we're glorifying His name. If we're not, we're blaspheming and grieving the Holy Spirit. The choice is up to us, but we have to rely on Him for the power. We can't provide the power for ourselves because we are sinful. We'll continue to do what we chose not to do. So we have to let Him empower us. And that's why Jesus left. And if you notice, He said that He will bring another counselor. Jesus counseled his disciples, and the people that he taught while he was here. He was here in person with us, but he wasn't with us every single moment of the day. There were times when Peter and John were over here, Jesus was over here. The Holy Spirit is with you every single second. Isn't that crazy? God is with you every single second. So you can't say that, oh, but God, you're not with me. He's with you all the time. Jesus knew exactly what you would go through in life. He went through even more. So He sent His Spirit to comfort you, to guide you, to empower you. Today, you guys honored me as pastor, and I thank you so much for that. And I promise to do everything I can to guide you, to be the example that you need to see, to let Jesus Christ fill me. I do everything in my power to take the eye out. I will pray daily and do that daily. And I'll give you a key verse that that helps me in just a minute. And we are springs of living, water-free Methodist church. A lot of words, right? So what is a spring? Dick shortened it for us early and said, we'll call you spring. What is a spring? A spring is part of the hydrosphere. It's what gives life to this world. You take water out of this world and everything in it dies. We are a spring of living water where the water comes up to the surface and people can drink from it. And we're supposed to provide that living water through our acts and our behavior. So we've got to let the Spirit, what? Rise up out of the well, don't we? We've got to let Him pour out through our lives so that when others do see us, they see Christ. Everybody knows John 3.16, right? You see it at football games and stuff. You'll see them come hold up John 3.16, right? What does it say? Good. That's the first part of it, like Paul Harvey says, right? You don't come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You don't have hope. Anything else, you don't have knowledge of God, you don't have His Spirit, unless you accept grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other way, no other name under heaven given to men. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's step one of taking I out. Step two is this, though. How many of you can quote this verse? Some of you can, probably. Come on. Dick, you can't quote it? Oh, Dick. So in John 3.16, you had an invitation. Will you accept me? Will you come to me? But Luke 9.23 says, what, Dick? You're looking for it. Help me out, brother. Mm Mm-hmm. That's how you take the eye out. It says, whoever in my Bible, just like it said whoever in John 3.16, whoever will answer Jesus' call, whoever wants to be my disciple must first deny himself to take up his cross, how often? Daily. And three, follow him. That's the only way you're ever going to take the eye out of the scenario. There's no other way. You've got to deny yourself and let God live through you. 
But you don't see that part of Christianity. You don't see people holding up those signs because that's tough. It takes a commitment. But that's what Jesus is inviting you to do. Do you want to take that commitment? Do you want to take this journey with Him? Or do you want to try to rely on fire insurance? Because if you take this as a whole, there are just as many verses that say, I will spew you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. That many will come to me and say, we did mighty wondrous things in your name. We even cast out demons. And Jesus says, depart from me, I do not know you. Jesus is inviting you to follow Him. And if you're going to get rid of the eye, you've got to deny yourself. Humble yourself and let God. You've got to take up your cross daily. Fight those demons. Give them to God daily. And you've got to follow Him. The young rich man said, What must I do to enter into heaven? And he said, Sell everything you have. And it wasn't about money. It meant give everything to God. Get rid of all the other garbage in your life. You were created to bring glory and honor to Him, not live your life the way you want to live it. You've been bought with a tremendous price. Jesus gave up everything. He gave up commanding stars and angels to come be a baby and to die for your sins. That's how much He loved you. So will you love Him back? Will you give to Him? Will you follow me on this journey that God has called us to be? He has called us out to be a body of believers that will represent Jesus Christ to this world. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for all that You do. I can't even comprehend the love that You give to Your children, but You pour it out so much. Father, help us to be obedient. Help me to be the example that I need to be, not by my own might, but by giving up my might and my will and letting You, Father, lead and guide me. Help this church to be the kind of individuals that they need to be. Encourage them to love one another, to not worry about their own needs or their own desires, but to love others just as Jesus Christ loved and gave Himself up for this church. Father, we just thank You so much for pursuing us passionately rather than giving us the punishment that we deserve. Thank You, Jesus, for coming and dying for me. And I will choose to follow You. I need Your strength. I need your empowerment to be able to do it. And when I fall short, please lift me up. Please help my brothers and sisters. Empower them to love me unconditionally. And help me to lead and guide them in the paths of righteousness. That thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world, the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Oh, Father, we ask that you would help us to deny the I. And to truly follow you. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen.